This podcast episode is brought to you by Coors Light. These days, everything is go, go, go. It's nonstop hustle all the time. Work, friends, family expect you to be on 24-7. Well, sometimes you just need to reach for a Coors Light because it's made to chill. Coors Light is cold lagered, cold filtered, and cold packaged. It's as crisp and refreshing as the Colorado Rockies. It is literally made to chill. Coors Light is the one I choose when I need to unwind. So when you want to hit reset, reach for the beer that's made to chill. Get Coors Light in the new look delivered straight to your door with Drizzly or Instacart. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Clipping Carlson. I'm your host, Julien Paquet. In case you didn't know, this is a place where we bring you the best from the last week throughout the Keeping Carlson network, because we know some of you are busy and don't have the time to listen to all this amazing content. We'll start uh, this week with uh, Sunday's main show, where Elon and Brian played a game of Would You Rather, like Would You Rather Have Player A or Player B on your roster for the end of the season? Their first debate is a great example of why you shouldn't maybe put too much value to big names. Like, would you rather have the former first overall picks, $11 million man, and who has uh, captained two NHL franchises throughout his career, or the guy who has been traded a few years back for Ryan Spooner? Uh, so this matchup is like two players who at the start of the year wouldn't have even been a question, right? John Tavares versus Ryan Strome. And you think, of course, Tavares, don't even bother me with this garbage. Going into today, uh, Tavares has been ice cold lately. He has only one point in his last five games. He's actually on pace for his worst season since his rookie campaign. Only 28 points in 37 games. It's a 62-point pace. Meanwhile, Ryan Strome, who had this whole narrative last year that like, oh, maybe he's like not that good. Yeah, he's getting a lot of points. He's probably over overperforming like he had a high shooting percentage like he was just benefiting from playing with Panarin I don't know say what you will but now going into this season he like finally went without a point for the first time in 12 games in Saturday's shocking 3-2 loss to Buffalo before that he was on a run of 16 points in 11 games and he now sits at 34 points in 37 games on the season that's a 75 point pace Strom is blowing Tavares out of the water though of course the past doesn't always predict the future so I'm curious to know if you had the option of one of these centers who would you take there's upside, which I think does lean Tavares. And then there's certainty, which, yeah, I'm going to say Ryan Strom provides some degree of certainty. Right now it is 75-point pace. Last year he was on a 69-point pace. Everything looks good for him. So I don't think that's going to change that Strom is going to produce between the 70 and 75-point pace the rest of the season. The question is, can Tavares top it? And this season, at five on five, I don't know that he's got a lot of opportunity to do that. Tavares has this really pedestrian production at five on five, and there's a few reasons for it. Uh, The first is not in his control. Actually, none of them are really in his control, but one of them is not due to variance. This is due to his coach. He's playing 60 seconds a night, less at five on five compared to what Tavares was playing last year. Then there's a couple pieces of variance that are hurting him in particular. First, Tom Tavares' is on a shooting percentage at five on five is barely above 6%, which is like three, honestly, maybe even 4% lower than where I, I'd expect Tavares and his line mates to be shooting. And then his own shooting percentage is down under 6% compared to 12% in his career, which is essentially double what he's been doing this season. And I, I did some math that's worth about four goals there, which would be enough to get Tavares up to a 70-point pace if we regress that shooting percentage. Like I said, he's probably at a 70-point pace just if you allow him like his normal shooting percentage the rest of the way. But the other missing five or 10 points that keep him from being an 80-point player the rest of the season are in minutes at five on five and uh, being that or I should say not being that lock on the top power play anymore, even though he's still mostly there. He's not as there as he has been the past couple of years. So your question is, do you take a 70-point Tavares who could really explode, especially if he does get some more power play one deployment, which honestly I'm open to. That power play one is doing just fine in Toronto, but the other guys on it aren't doing anything so special. Um, or you can just go with Steady Strom at 70 to 75 points, I think I would go like this is this is tough for me. This is two flavors. 
I would want to go to Vares just for the upside because I think he has a better chance of being able to hit an 80 point pace. But I definitely wouldn't begrudge anyone for choosing Ryan Strom, who's already there at, at like or already just below that 80 point pace. And I think is probably going to be able to stay there. Yeah, I'm gonna. This is gonna be one where I'm gonna disagree with you. I had a feeling you'd go Tavares. Like, I just have a couple things that you said. I just, not like I disagree, but it's like this vibe of even if Tavares is on the top power play, like I said, it just really feels like this is the Marner and Matthews show this yeah. year. You know, like I just don't feel like they're running things through Tavares. Meanwhile, Strom, like you're saying, like oh, he's a steady like 70, 75 point guy. Like, like I said, he's on a huge run right now. The real story, of course, is Artemi Panarin, who's had three straight multi point games now, and Strom is playing with him all the time. I don't know. I just feel. Feel like Strom is the safer bet to be like right there in the midst of all the offense. While it seems like the Leafs are happy to let Marners and Matthew get all the yeah. points, but it, it'll probably be close. But I think I would actually lean Strom. Talking about a big name players who you shouldn't get too attached to, the guys from Short Shifts uh, talked about whether you should drop Johnny Gaudreau this week. You know, if I was in a position where I thought that I could, you know, afford to uh, afford to have. You know, just this one game this week, you know, I've, I'm kind of punting on this week and, and I'm just going to coast on into the playoffs. I might see myself holding on to him, like you said, those those three off day games. But I would look at that schedule and see how how important that's going to be to you. Is it really adding some some games played value? Because like you said, five points in 16 games for Gaudreau, that's not the kind of thing that you like to see. I would be very hesitant to pick him up. I know he's out there on the wire right now. I'm not looking to grab him. Like we said, we're both clinched. Uh, I don't know what your plans are, but I think uh, he's not going to see a bid from me uh, as we as we head into next week. I'm more or less over it. I mean, if I had roster space, there are worse uh, worse guys to take a shot on. But like, if you're looking at, I don't know, if you're looking at your waiver wire, I know that Michael Bunting is the big name, but that one is somebody who I, I'm not quite as excited about. But like, if you're looking at your- I've wa- got one for you. If you're looking, let me give you one. You're looking at your waiver wire, okay. you see Jared McCann. I mean, it's a pretty obvious drop to me. Oh yeah, that's that one's a no brainer. I mean, he's been unconscious on that first power play, shooting the lights out. How about one that's a little tighter? Jesper Bratt has been on a nice scoring streak, but he's not shooting very much. Doesn't quite have that McCann deployment. Uh, would you rather have Jesper Bratt or uh, Johnny Gaudreau? It's it's actually kind of interesting that you mentioned that to me because a friend of the pod, Jordan, who is our competitor in Tier One. Um, is the is the player who dropped Johnny Gaudreau. And he was asking me, like, if I would do it. And I told him, um, you know, maybe not. And I was looking through his roster, and I saw he has Jesper Bratt and Igor Sharangovich. And I was like, you're not going to drop one of those devils instead? And he's like, no, they're, they'll both probably outscore Johnny Gaudreau, even on a week where he's playing. And I said, I agree with you on Bratt, who scored, who scored again tonight. I mean, Jesper Bratt's been really good. I, I, I like Bratt. I don't I don't buy it with Sharon Govich though. So that's sort of uh, that's the distinction. That's sort of the line for me that I, that I'll draw is, you know, uh Jesper Bratt, I get it. Igor Sharon Govich, that's a a step too far. On Sunday, Elon and Brian also talked about a guy who's becoming a big name himself. Adam Fox, defenseman for the New York Rangers, was on a 78 point pace this year and he has 21 points in his last 13 games. Yes, you heard right. 21 points in 13 games. So, next year, do you take the big name, Victor Hedman, who's a Norris and Stanley Cup winner, or Adam Fox? Rangers are scoring a lot of goals recently, and Fox has clearly stepped up as not only the top power play defenseman on the Rangers, but maybe one of the top defensemen in the league, at least for yeah. fantasy, but also, like, not, because he's, like, apparently a really good defenseman just in general. Yeah. Uh, 33 points in 36 games on the season now. That puts him in second in D scoring behind only Victor Hedman, which means Fox is ahead of John Carlson, Dougie Hamilton, Tyson Barry, Shea Theodore, Chris Letang. The only other player that probably should be in that conversation is Kale McCarr, because he has a higher point pace than both uh, Hedman and Fox, but unfortunately he's missed some time. Where is he going to rank next year in people's draft list? Do you take him as like the second, third defenseman in fantasy? He's way, way, way up there. I'm trying to find reasons to tell you that Adam Fox's 39 power play point pace is not going to sustain. Uh, I 
don't like oh, it's not going to sustain okay but he's not going to be that far off like he is looking very clearly like a 30 plus power play point guy plus some fantastic five on five production as well and he's someone like you said Elon who's been consistent uh, almost all year at the start of the year, he had a bit of a slow patch when he first ended up on the top unit, but since then has just been gangbusters, especially getting in on so much of this crazy Rangers production lately. I have nothing bad to say about Adam Fox. I'm really excited for like we us to have another really high-end fantasy option. You know, in fantasy hockey, you can be a big name because you've been amazing for a long time, or you can also be a big name because everyone knows that you're not that good. Martin Jones of the San Jose Sharks had had uh, very bad numbers for a couple of years now, but he's on a hot streak. So the guys talked about him, and let's just say I've been surprised at how much they like him for the rest of the season. Like all of a sudden, the San Jose Sharks, they're right in this thing. And a lot of that recent success has come on the back of none other than Martin Jones, who's led in only two goals on 67 shots in the last two game series versus the Kings. And he's now on a 6 1 and 1 run in his last eight games, sporting a 940 save percentage in that span. Right. Martin Jones is like the goal that we've probably talked about the most on the show as being not good. I- First, I just want to talk about Martin Jones and how wild this last run has been for him. The last time that Martin Jones played a string of five or more games with a save percentage above 9.05. Elon, do you want to guess? I mean, it's like, I remember the Sharks, like, were good. Like, he was good for a couple years. There's a reason why he got that contract, right? So is it like back then, like five seasons ago, four seasons ago? It was March 2018. It's been (laughs) three years. So when you're asking me if I believe in him this time, the answer is no. Do I want to believe in him, Elon? Yes, desperately there's so much fantasy value that we just lose in that shark's crease every year even though they're not as good a team as they once were uh, there are a couple years where there should have been value there and there wasn't so that's why i'm hoping but that doesn't mean i'm hopeful that martin jones can keep him up that said i've added him to my cupful roster in case that he can keep it up so i've at least uh, put some skin in the game here Later on in the show, the guys were discussing if they'd rather have Jonathan Bernier or Peter Mrazek on the roster for the rest of the season. Martin Jones' name uh, creeped back into the conversation once again. Just to make it more complicated for you, Martin Jones versus Peter Mrazek. Now you guys really cry. Martin Jones, oh wow. Yeah, I'm going to take, I'll take the chance. Assuming that I'm probably going to end up dropping one of these guys anyway, I'll take the chance. Yeah, I guess it also, this one really comes down to your league settings, right? For wins, I just feel like Carolina is such a good team. Like, you've almost got, you've got a really good shot at a win every time Razak plays, though. Like, like we said, San Jose's been looking good. Staying with goalies, if Martin Jones has been the poster child of inconsistency in net for a few years now, the Boston Bruins goalie have been literally the opposite. But Tuka Rask and Yaroslav Alak are injured right now, and the Bruins have to rely on Two rookie goalies, Dan Vladar and Jeremy Swayman. The guys from Short Shifts offered the breakdown of the Boston goalie situation right now. So um, we have seen both players put up good numbers. Uh, pre- earlier in this year, Swayman, for his part, has been very good on the Providence Bruins, a 189 GAA and a 933 save percentage in nine games. Has an 8-1 and one record with a shutout. I'm thinking basically they're going to go hot hand until Tuka Rask can come back, and then that will determine who sticks with the club. Anything you want to add to this uh, rundown here, Lewis? No, I think you've got the right idea. It seems like we've got two guys with outstanding debuts, uh, and you know I don't know that Swayman is going to be able to continue on the pace that he's set for himself just in the same way Vladar was not able to in that huge game he had against Pittsburgh. Sure looks like the Bruins trust uh, Jeremy Swayman because he's supposed to get his uh, third start in a row uh, on Saturday night. He's posted a 952 and a 936 save percentage in his two first starts. Talking about fresh starts, uh, we had a trade this week, a fantasy relevant trade. Kyle Palmieri and Travis J. Jack are going from the Devils to the New York Islanders. Once again, Ben and Lewis were there to help us figure out what we should make of this. With the Islanders, it does almost feel kind of like a Montreal top nine kind of setup because, you know, uh, this line with Peugeot and, and Zajac is, is not nothing. Like, these are guys with skill. I kind of like that, but I don't know that he's going to be as relied upon as maybe he would have been uh, in New Jersey. 
Uh, I kind of look at it as a side grade. I really don't think it's something to get super excited about. I also don't think it's a disaster, even though we're sort of calling this a third line spot. I would like to see him get up with Matt Barzal. And like, this is game one, right? So who knows where he'll be in a few games. I, I definitely don't think he's locked into a third line role in, in Long Island, on Long Island. What we've seen so far, the Islanders did have a five minute major early in their game tonight against Philadelphia. And so Palmieri was on a unit with Josh Bailey, Brock Nelson, Jean-Gabriel Peugeot, and Nick Letty. The other unit, of course, Barzal, Eberle, Matt Martin, and Anthony Bavillier, and Ryan Pulak. Uh, I don't... That, this is where, for me, it, it sort of falls off. And, and we talked about it the other night. Kyle Palmieri's pace this year, still only on pace for 40 points over a full season. Way, way down relative to what we've seen from him. A big thing for that is his shooting percentage is low. One thing that I've always said about Kyle Palmieri is how good he is at scoring on the power play. He's always been above average at even strength, but on the power play from 2017 to 2020, he ranked sixth in goals per 60 league-wide. That's a list that goes like this. David Pasternak, Mika Zibanejad, Steven Stamkos, Patrick Laine, Austin Matthews, Kyle frickin' Palmieri. Elite, elite power play goal score right ahead of Leon Dreisaitl and Braden Point. So I think that this is kind of a bummer for Kyle Palmieri, that he's not going to a team that's going to put him in a position to score a buttload of power play goals. Well, listen, you make a really compelling argument. You've brought so much evidence to bear, but... You know, you just get the eye test on Matt Martin, and why would you not have that guy out <laughs> with Matt Barzal? Let's end with a clip of the stream scheme, where Dave uh, recommended that you pick up Connor Brown this weekend. If you did, you're a pretty happy camper because he has yet not to score this week. And lastly, our ludicrous streamer of the week is Connor Brown of the Ottawa Senators. Another little fun fact that you can use at parties is that, you, did you know that Connor Brown has goals in each of his last three games? It's true. It's darn true. And that's mainly because Connor Brown is playing on the top power play in Ottawa. And while his even strength line mates ain't great, he's at least seeing heavy minutes. And he has been for a while, actually. In the last month, Connor Brown played one game where he saw about 16 minutes 50 seconds another game where he saw 15 minutes 44 seconds but other than those two that's it he's consistently getting over 17 minutes a night putting up multiple shots not always getting points it's very possible we're catching connor brown at the end of a points run here but that's a risk i'm willing to take for a ludicrous streamer, the Ottawa Senators have one of the best schedules of the week, playing on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. He's a ludicrous streamer, so you know he's available pretty much everywhere with only 2% rostered on Yahoo right now. So if you're in a deep, deep league, pick up Connor Brown. That's it for this week's Clipping Carlson. I thank you for listening. As always, I invite you to listen for yourself to all the amazing content out there from the Keeping Carlson Network every week. So we'll talk again next Saturday. Goodbye.